And our scripture this morning, as much as we um, most of the time follow the, one of the prescribed lessons found in the New Revised Common Lectionary, um, during Lent we're going to deviate from that and we're going to follow the readings that are in the Lenten prayer journal. So this morning, our reading, before we even get to that, it, it helps to know that even though early in the gospel, our, our reading, just before that, we will have heard that Jesus, um, that, that he, he, he taught and he healed people in the synagogue. And, and that's what comes right before our reading this morning. But, but it doesn't go on to say, you know, and then the next thing he did, or in a couple of days, or in a little while. No. Our reading this morning, you'll hear it say, immediately. There's a sense of urgency, immediately. Um, the Greek word euthus, um, often translated as immediately or at once, occurs 41 times in the little gospel of Mark. That means that it happens about every 16 verses, immediately, every 16 verses. Uh, um, and then we need to remember as well that in the first 28 verses of Mark, th this sense of urgency, that, that just in 28 verses, um, Jesus is going to be baptized by John the Baptist. He's going to be tempted. He's going to teach. He's going to recruit his first followers. It's, it's a hyperspeed story. He, he heals a tormented man. Mark's clear. Jesus doesn't just sit around. He acts over and over. He knows the importance of, of when there is challenge, when there is hurt, when there is injustice, when there is love that is missed. It doesn't need to happen off in the future. It's right now. There's that urgency of doing right, living right, seeking justice, and sharing love. But he's not just action. As our passage moves on this morning, we're going to see that Jesus also stopped. He stopped to reflect, to pray, to remove himself to withdraw. Je Jesus goes into times of introspection. It's the time to ponder, to consider, to, to ask himself, has he lost his way? Has he lost his sense of purpose? Is he misguided? Does he not have the right focus? Does he really know that he is chasing what is true and real? So here now, bless you, the urgency and the stopping from the gospel of Mark. And immediately Jesus left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay sick with a fever and immediately... They told him of her. And he came and he took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she served them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered together about the door, and Jesus healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And in the morning, a great while before day, Jesus rose and went out to a lonely place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him pursued him, and they found him, and they said to him, everyone is searching for you. And Jesus said to them, let us go on to the next town's that I may preach there also, for that is what, why I came out. And he went throughout Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. 
the word of God for the people of God. I, I, I have to admit, confess, um, share that I, I, was, um, I was feeling pretty full of myself. Call it arrogance, hubris, um, wh- whatever way you wish to define it. Um, it, it was 10 years ago, and, and we were getting ready to do all the work on our steeple, to tuck point all the brick and, and replace a lot of the brick, to copper the steeple, and, and then to put a new finial that re- replaced the one that had been here prior to that many years before. Um, and in the preparation for it, the steeple jacks, they came and they brought this gigantic boom truck. And um, the, the, the crane, they had to close down Aurora Street um, for the crane that reached up 150 feet up into the air. Um, one little boom, skinny, with a single little wire dangling below it, carrying a little metal basket. Well, the foreman, he came over to me, and he offered to take me up with him so that I could see the work that they were going to be doing. And I said, oh, sure, I guess. I was so excited. I had been hoping that he would take me up. So they gave me a hard hat and a harness, and we climbed into the basket and clipped in. And I thought, I really don't plan to fall out. It's okay. And the hard hat, though, if we did fall, I'm not sure what it would do. Well, then with a thumbs up from the foreman, the the crane operator, who wisely remained down on the ground, maybe he could have used that hard hat in case we fell on him, Well, he started lifting us up and up and up we went until we were dangling 30 feet above the tip of the steeple. The view. Wow. Lake Erie, Canada. (laughs) You couldn't see any of that. But you could see way out over the valley. And it was pretty stunning. That was great. Looking around. But looking down, not so much, especially when you then looked up also and saw what it was that was holding you up there and the wind dangling by that little wire. Well, my my mind had started playing terrible tricks on me. I'd seen them assemble that crane. Three skinny, giant pieces of metal put together with little cotter pins that were rusting out And then each of those three telescoped out even further. All that, with that little cable dangling. Did I tell you it was windy? And that's when the what if started to play in my head. What if that little wire, did they really check it? It's probably old. Maybe it was fraying. What if it got caught in one of those pulleys? What would happen? Or what if, you know, those booms, they're really thin and worn over time. What if they broke? Or what if that wind, remember it was windy, what if it blew us over? And then finally, the operator lowered us down, well, not far, just so that we were at the very top of the steeple, still 120 feet up above the ground. The foreman, he had told me, we're just going to take you up for a quick look. I thought, okay, soon we'll go down. We'll be down safe on solid earth. But then the foreman changed his mind. He said, well, as long as we're up here, I I should get some measurements. And and I want to take off a couple of these boards to to see what's rotting out. And and, and then he, he grabbed the top of the steeple and he started shaking it, pulling it back and forth. I thought, If he pulls it too hard and it snaps and falls on top of... I had to remind myself, cranes do this sort of work all the time. And they never fall. Well, not that often. But what if we were the one? So the foreman asked 
I, so I asked the foreman, I, I asked the foreman if he ever got dangerous way up there. I said, ah, not usually. But sometimes, on windy days like today, <laughs> but I'm not nervous today, he said, because I'm up here with you, a minister. <laughs> and all I could think is, I don't do cranes. <laughs> that, that's not a part of my job, a part of my gig. So for the next 20 minutes, that seemed like many hours, uh, until we were back down, I, I did a lot of thinking. I, I, I contemplated a lot of stuff, what mattered most to me. A lot of reflecting, yeah, believe it or not, about life and about God. More reflecting than I'd probably done in the months before. Why? Why? Because I was removed, separated off, and really, really afraid. But you don't have to be in a scary situation, and you don't have to be dangling 150 feet above the ground to do it. Sometimes we just need to shake things up a little bit to, to, to finally look at our lives more thoughtfully, more completely, more fully. So Jesus. Jesus was action-based. He was driven. He was a hustler. Now, 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 be careful. Not, not, not the deceitful, fraudulent kind. Not immorally pushing ill. I mean a hustler in the very best sense of the word. He never lost focus on doing absolutely everything and anything he could do that mattered and acting quickly when it was needed, always willingly going outside of conventional wisdom and cultural norms. Now, now not just to be a radical, not just to shake things up, not just to get attention, not just to look different. No. No. Doing it, if it meant doing real good, if it meant fulfilling true justice, if it meant honestly offering God's love where it was needed the most. But, but you can only do that if in the midst of constant motion, in the midst of constant reinventing, in, in inserting yourself into situations, if you stop long enough now and then to reflect, to dig deep, to, to see if what you're doing is really right and good and loving, it actually makes a difference in the world. I wonder, have you ever noticed that sometimes there are people who do what is truly right and fair, but in so doing, they actually make the world worse and make life worse for the person that they are trying to help? I remember one day years and years ago when one of my kids, really little back then, when they were being picked on, when they were being bullied by some of the older kids in the neighborhood. I thought, that just isn't right. I can't let that stand. So I was going to go out and I was going to straighten those bullies out, re-guide them. Happily, Amy knew better. She told me even though I was right that they were wrong and I was right to want to stop them in what they were doing and that in fact even the action may well be just if I did or said anything I would actually make things simply worse for my child. Just being right, just being just, isn't always enough. Sometimes we need to know and understand what is right, what is good, what is fair, what is loving, and then to reflect enough to know whether our actions bring God's love, God's presence, God's healing into a broken world. 
I'm pretty sure that's why Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the three synoptic gospels, the very first thing that Jesus did before going into his ministry was to go off into that what? That deserted place, into the wilderness, into that spot where he would face his own, what was it? Not in our reading, but the normal reading this morning, to face his own demons. Demons. What are those? Well, maybe, maybe, maybe we might think of them also as his misunderstandings or his biases or his preconceived ideas or his warped perception of reality or, or the things he deserved and should have. Or... Demons. If Jesus had them and Jesus needed to go out and reflect and, and take corrective action and focus if Jesus needed that, don't you think we probably need that too? And Jesus, he didn't just go for a quick little, I, I love it. When, uh, so often when I'm in a gathering and before the meeting or before a meal, I say, Pastor, will you offer a short prayer? Well, maybe, maybe it'll be long. Well, the important part here is he didn't go out just for that brief little moment where, where not much would happen. No, we're told that he went out there for 40 days. And not just then, he did it over and over and over again throughout his ministry. Like in our reading this morning, that comes just 15 verses after his 40-day time out in the wilderness. He did it again. In, well, do you remember he did it after he fed the 5,000 people with just, what, a couple of fish and five loaves of bread, and he needed to separate out. No, am I chasing the right things? And then again, we hear that he did it right before he was arrested. That's a pretty smart move. Before he was going to make the ultimate commitment and sacrifice to do that thing that there was no turning back from, was his cause, what, was what he was doing right it's a good time to make sure that that was correct. Honestly, in life, sometimes it's a lot easier just to act. To act instinctually, from the gut, with our preconceived ideas. It's easier to just act and not think or reflect. But when we do so, we often do it at our own peril and the peril of the purpose of our lives. You know, honestly, there's a reason we don't do it. It's hard. It's really hard to look at oneself fully, to dig down and see the blemishes, the challenges, the ill ideas, that, the things we don't want the world to see. To see yourself for who you really are, and how you touch the world, it's even harder these days when, when there's this 24-7 ability to distract ourselves. Everything from smartphones to TVs that never go off the air with thousands of channels. And so we can distract. I think about it like this. It was over 40 years ago now that I had the opportunity to spend four days absolutely by myself with only a journal, a jug of wa water, some matches, and a sleeping bag. I, I was dropped, dropped off on a tiny little island off the coast of Maine. And when I say tiny, I mean there wasn't a single tree on it. And at high tide, I could stand on one side and throw a rock and land on the water on the other side with my non-dominant hand. And in that moment, I was excited. Hubris, arrogance, full of self in that moment, I was going to have that chance to prove my survival skills. I could get by just fine. It was going to be great. I was going to forage for food because I had none with me. And I, I wasn't even off the boat for five minutes when I realized I didn't have anything to do but look for food. 
and there really weren't many places to look for food on that barren little rock. And all I was left to do was to look for food that couldn't be found and fight off the birds that were nesting there and rightly thought that I had invaded their space. And that's when it hit me. I was alone. Truly alone, no distractions, and not just for a minute or two. But I had a hundred hours ahead of me. And I really didn't like it. I, I was left with no way to hide for, uh, for me to um, keep my own thoughts at bay. Four straight days with nothing to do but think, but reflect. It, it was awful. I mean, it was horrible. I mean, it was painful. And it was one of the best things I've ever done. It was the start, it was the beginning of, of for the first time in my life, really knowing the importance of not just going through life by acting, by doing, by assuming that I already had it right, that I knew what needed to be done, and, and that others didn't have wisdom to share with me, and that I didn't have those flaws and foibles that needed to be confronted. But a need... To reflect. It's why I hope you'll join one of those reflect circles. It's a process of getting started, of reminding ourselves with intentionality of doing it. It's why I hope you'll take that prayer journal, that journal for reflecting, and actually do it throughout Lent. Not because it's going to be the answer, but it's the nudge forward without having to go high upon a steeple or separate yourself off on a teeny little island for four days. I wonder um, if any of you given up something for Lent. You, you don't need to show me. Given up chocolate or wine or something you really like. Don't bother. I, I mean, don't bother. Don't bother if, if that is the act in and of itself. That simply by doing away with it, that you are living into Lent. What's the point of giving something up that has the potential for something really good? It's when you give it up and it reminds you one of the gifts that we have received that are so abundant, but also if it helps push you to reflect on the things that you depend upon, if it helps you to reflect more deeply on your own life, if it can cause you to do that, then by all means do it. But there is no magic in just giving up chocolate. just as coming to worship. Coming to worship is good no matter what because th there, there's that chance, even if we come just thinking it's going to check off the box, maybe something will slip in. But the best of worship comes when we say we are in a safe space outside of the rest of the pressures of the world and we open our hearts and our minds to allow God to enter in, to rethink our lives, our relationship to the world, to God and to all people. In this season... I hope each of us have that chance to take that dedicated time to think, to reflect, to consider who we are and maybe to re-understand in new ways how we can be a better, more loving touch on the world. It's why we form as faith community for many reasons, but it's why we're going to be welcoming right now 18 of the 22 who are joining us. is that chance to communally do what it's difficult to do alone, to be communal in our gathering, in our worship, and our reflection, so that individually we can do it as well. May this season be a time of true reflection, introspection, reinventing, finding a clear sense of what the children talked about, the heart song of God, to find God within more fully. Amen.